some people are losing the fight and it sucks. We gotta do everything we can to help organizations get into a better spot. It starts with basic discipline around cybersecurity awareness and training for end users and then you know just getting the basics right. Hey everybody, and welcome to the Incident Report presented by Quest Technology Management. I'm Paul Burke, Director of Technology Communications. Every week, I'm joined by VP of Sales and Partnerships, Adam Burke. The Incident Report brings you conversations with thought leaders, business innovators, and channel mavericks to help you stay productive and agile in a changing technology landscape. Welcome back to the Incident Report. I'm your host, Paul Burke. Adam, how are you doing today? Good, Paul. How's everything going for you today? I'm doing great. Feeling good. It was a nice Memorial Day weekend. How was your Memorial Day? Good weekend with the family. Got to, uh, you know, always good to remember sacrifices and op uh, our opportunities to live in a free country and those who came before us. But um, yeah, excited to be here. Good to, good to go. Well said. So today we got some great stories on MSPs, Broadcom and VMware, and then also uh, ransomware. Is it good for the industry? Which might sound like a strange question, but we'll dive into it in a little bit. Um, but first, we're going to talk about MSPs. So this article is on channel2e.com, and it's called Have MSP Valuations Finally Peaked? MSP evaluations and M&A deals flow remain strong, but rising interest rates and U.S. stock market correction may be pressuring sky-high MSP valuations down a bit in Q2 2022. I like how they call it a stock market correction. It sounds much nicer. Yeah, yeah. Then Bloodletting is not necessarily a preferred term, but so yeah, correction, correction is a little softer, softer and gentler. Valuations remain high, but anecdotal evidence suggests that MSP valuations may have peaked somewhere in Q1 of 2022 and are now dipping a bit in Q2, according to channel E to E. Some of the evidence they cite is the volume of overall mergers and acquisitions extending far beyond the MSP market is down from the brisk pace of 2021. Companies in the U.S. have struck $789.5 billion of mergers so far this year, down 31% from the same period in 21. As markets swing, the broader economic uncertainty gives many deal makers pause. And finally, IPO activity, meanwhile, has come to a virtual standstill as would-be public companies wait for calm waters, the journal concluded. So again, like you said, blood lighting, there's a lot of blood in the water and everybody's waiting for things to calm down. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I mean, this is happening across the board and this isn't only MSPs, but mainly organizations right now are, are getting hammered and people are looking for like for real revenue. Organizations, you know, traditionally in the last couple of years, money has been cheap, right? And, and when money is cheap, that, you know, means basically you can borrow money at a very, very low, low rate, right? So like everyone knows your mortgage rate, right? You, you talk to a buddy and talk to somebody and they're like, yeah, yeah, I just refinanced for 2.5% or 2.7% on a 30 year fixed. That's stupid stupid cheap money and what's happening is that 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 stupid cheap money is also available for financing large you know large acquisitions chasing a return so you get these you know msps and other organizations that that kind of create these ebitda multiples and you look at you you look at basically you you get a bunch of debt you can can you go acquire these firms and, and hopefully service that debt hopefully your return is greater than the cost of your capital that took to buy it. So valuations have gotten way, way out of whack. I mean, people are paying 20 to 30 times next year's revenue. Like forget EBITDA, forget like actual earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. Like just people are paying stupid multiples for, for future revenue. And that I think that's that's kind of the Federal Reserve decided to increase interest rates. That's put a tighten on, on, that's basically made money a little bit more valuable to maybe hold and don't, don't jack up your debt so high. So I think it's kind of, it's kind of put a little bit of a chill on, uh, on the, you know, the multiples around, you know, MSP valuations. I mean, I don't know, farther down the article, it still talks about valuations for firms with EBITDA under 500 K, you know, they're still getting four to five X four to five X their, their EBITDA, right? So you have an organization that makes five, 500 K a year in, in EBITDA in your, in that annual, that annual metric, you're, you're, you're getting a check for 2.5 million on that company. So it's better than a sharp stick in the eye, but it's definitely, it's definitely cooled off a little bit. MSP's annual EBITDA is 2 million or more in Q1. The valuation was 10 times to 14 times. Now in Q2, it's down seven to nine. So it's almost halved, but still pretty high. Yeah. I mean, that's still good. And that's still, it's different. It's definitely compressed a little bit, but it's also, you know, why does this matter? 
it matters because people build their businesses and they acquire things and they sell things out in the market based on how that's going to translate to the valuation of their company. So I love channel EDE puts together articles like this because it tells you what's going on out in the market. You know, when we compete against other firms, when other firms compete against us, when we go evaluate software vendors or partners, those types of thing, how are they valuing their business? How are they structuring their, how are they structuring their offerings? Some of them, some of them build business plans. This is pretty common. Mm -hmm. A lot of people build MSPs in order to flip them. It's kind of like, it's like house flipping, right? You figure out the mechanics of, okay, I need X amount of customers. I need X amount of subscriptions. I, here's my labor costs. Here's my EBITDA. You put, the, if you put it in this, in this soup and you go pitch it out to private equity firms and venture capital guys out there. Totally, totally understandable model. That's a business model. In the, in the IT space, you know, partners and customers and clients and, you know, us as a, as a provider ourselves, you got to be aware of that because that's, that's the landscape you're dealing with. That's what you're competing with. That's what you're partnering with. That's what you're investing in when you're evaluating other software providers. It's, it's, it's cool to see this, the kind of underlying mechanics of the market. I think, I think you're going to see a, a few more of these, a few more of these organizations kind of flush themselves out that are, you know, there's some big, there's some big shops that are on the block looking, looking for a buyer right now. We, we've seen a few of them. So I was going to mention the, they have a great uh, quote from Linda Rose, who's a former IT solutions provider who sold three businesses and she operates a business now called Rose Biz, which is a boutique sell side technology M&A advisory firm. She says, keep in mind, this is more than an EBITDA multiple discussion. You also need to understand and analyze your company's evaluation based on revenue, gross profit margins, net income, and year over year growth, which I think you are alluding to as well. It's more than just EBITDA. Well, EBITDA is one of those things that liars figure and figures and not that people manipulate their EBITDA, but people manipulate their EBITDA. And so she has a great point that you got to look at revenue. You got to look at top clients. You got to look at profit margins net income, how are you growing year over year? Like you can, you can play all sorts of financial shenanigans, Enron style and manipulate your EBITDA. But she has a great point. How, how are you actually growing? What's the health of the business? How you, how you evaluate that? It's a big deal to make sure you get that right. And Adam, speaking of acquisition, our next article, an era has ended. Inside the $61 billion Broadcom VMware deal rocking the software industry. You can find this article on channelfutures.com and you can find links to all articles discussed today in the description. VMware was in a quandary and analysts told Channel Futures. So partners and analysts are giving mixed reactions to Broadcom's plans for a massive acquisition of VMware. And Adam, I'd love your thoughts too on your reaction to it. Broadcom and VMware announced the $61 billion deal on Thursday. It represents another step in Broadcom's expensive effort to expand its software portfolio through inorganic growth. It would raise Broadcom's software mix for 23% of the company's revenue to just under one half. On the other hand, the industry has widely characterized the move as a good financial outcome for VMware and billionaire Michael Dell. One partner said the companies offer solid synergies, but some analysts are scratching their heads as to how it will add value to VMware partners and customers. Adam, uh, what say you to this? It's exciting. Definitely, definitely an exciting, uh, exciting opportunity. I think Broadcom, you know, huge hardware player. They've done some other consolidations in the past. This is kind of that, you know, internet of things, hardware, software, VMware's been EMC, Dell, standalone. It's kind of been one of those organizations that have been bought and sold a few times. From a provider standpoint, it's a, it's a huge operator in the virtualization, you know, business continuity, recovery space. So it's a massive underlying partner, you know, of ours. And I'll be interested to see if it goes through. I think there's some arbitrage going on in the stock kind of game here going on. There's still got to be some, some approvals. Uh, I know there's got to be some approvals in Europe that approve this as well as the United States from a approving the sale. So there's definitely some, some, there can be some time on this one. I, I don't think it's a done deal from, from what I've been reading. You know, you don't, you don't make a $61 billion acquisition, you know, with a you know, the one to two year time horizon. I mean, this is a, this is a significant long-term investment around, obviously, you know, obviously they're seeing something in that partnership that something's going to pay off that, that 61 billion. So it'd be interesting to see. I'm not smart enough to know what it is. So Adam Bicknell pointed out VMware's strength in cybersecurity, which it boosted through the acquisition of Carbon Black in 2019. 
VMware currently has a strong reputation for its cybersecurity capability in safeguarding imports, workloads, and containers. Broadcom's best shot at making this deal work is to let profitable VMware be VMware, Vic Nell said. Adam, do you think Broadcom is going to kind of keep hands off, or do, do they have a history of kind of getting in there and wanting to tinker? I'd be interesting to see just kind of much as anyone else around if they, they leave kind of VMware alone and let them operate as they have been. They do have a good reputation in security. They have addressed, you know, security gaps and things that have come up, you know, relatively quickly. There were some exploits back in 2016 through 2018 that got addressed, but they also have a lot of different business units. So they address cybersecurity, optimization as a service, you know, cloud subscriptions. There are a lot of different levers that can be pulled within that within that organization. And, and, you know, they have been running profitable business units for a long time. So be, I, I think I'd have to agree with Big Nell there. That's a good, that's a good overview. If you're looking in your crystal ball, because I know Broadcom back in 2018 was trying to acquire Qualcomm, but that got, that got shut down by the U S government. Do you see any issues with this merger? If I knew that one, I'd be, a, I'd be in there doing the arbitrage like the rest of those guys. But you know, those, the, the Qualcomm deal was more of a, a similar similar offering, right? So manufacturing chips and, and things like that. This one's more of a software kind of a situation. So I don't know how regulators would kind of, would kind of nuke this the way they did the Qualcomm bid, but I'm sure anything that's of this size is going to draw, you know, interest from regulators and they're going to, you know, extract their pound of flesh or whatever they do on these types of deals. When you're looking at this merger, what other companies out there do you think this really catches the eye of? Well, so, so Broadcom versus VMware, VMware sells directly to enterprises as opposed to like acting as a supplier, right? So it, it's kind of a different, it's kind of a different attack for, for the market. So it's, it's like, they're kind of getting into send, you know, selling directly to end users and, and other business units, as opposed to being like an arms dealer for the underlying supply of manufacturing and components and things like that. So this is more of a more of a, a, you know, direct business to business as opposed to a supplier of the infrastructure that eventually makes it to the enterprise. It's kind of, it. kind of short circuits that, which is a different move. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Our final article I wanted to talk about comes from Channel Features as well. We dared to ask, is ransomware good for business? Doctors wouldn't likely say disease is good for business. And the same is true for ransomware. Is ransomware good for business? And what aren't we talking about when we should be talking about cybersecurity? With ransomware attacks continuing to escalate, cybersecurity providers have their hands full. And that translates to increased sales and revenue. But would anyone dare to admit ransomware is good for business? I realize I've said, is ransomware good for business about four times now? Because there's not a lot to this article, but I do think it's an interesting topic. And I, I'd love to know your thoughts on it. Well, I think it depends what business you're in. I mean, if you're in dentistry and you're providing services to your customers around helping to clean their teeth mm -hmm. and you get encrypted and lose all of their dental records, then no, ransomware is definitely not good for your business. If you're a cybersecurity firm and your job is to help organizations protect against and you know defend their enterprises and their core assets, then yeah, I mean, I don't know why anyone would be afraid to say it's good for business. It just depends what the business you're in. I mean, Right now, God forbid, I mean, everyone's really upset about what's going on in Eastern Europe, but I don't, I don't see Raytheon or General Dynamics or Lidos or any of their stocks plummeting right now. So is war good for business? Well, it depends what business you're in. Yeah, Pfizer, we all dealt with COVID for the past two years. Uh, I think they're doing pretty good. So it just depends what business are you in and what threat are you, are you addressing? Ransomware, unfortunately, is catastrophic for the entire, like, economy and it extracts trillions of dollars. So it is terrible for business from a productivity standpoint, but from a cybersecurity standpoint and from a cybersecurity awareness standpoint, it's really kind of, I think it was Warren Buffett said that, you know, when the tide goes out, you see who's swimming naked. Well, people don't necessarily, he probably said it more eloquently than that, but basically when there's trouble, and when there's problems, you get to understand, okay, who's been faking the funk and who actually has their stuff wired tight and together. You know, the, the, the trouble is always going to come. Pain's always going to flow in. Things are always going to go wrong. And ransomware has kind of shined a, like a giant spotlight 
on organizations that could improve their security. So is it good for business? It, it, it's a trillion dollar suck of, out of our economy and lost productivity and is making small and medium businesses go away. So no, it's not air quotes, good for business. Is it, is it good in the sense that it's, it's identifying problems, gaps, and areas where people can improve? Yeah. In that sense, it's good. And if you're a cybersecurity firm, is it, is it boosting your revenue and is it, is it making you, you know, a good amount of, a good amount of money helping organizations secure their environments? Yeah. Yeah. So, so, but overall, if the cybersecurity industry represents 5% of the economy and, you know, 95% of the economy is bleeding out, it's probably not a good thing. And you got, we got to figure out a better way to, to address it and get organizations a little bit more aware of, of their risks and security, but it's just starting, unfortunately. I mean, it's, it's just begun from a, a cyber uh, security threat and ransomware standpoint. It's, I think we're in, you know, the first or second inning of a long game here. Adam, that was your mic drop moment. Do you remember that game NBA Jam, the arcade game NBA Jam, when anytime you made a dunk, the announcers would scream, you're on fire. I love that game. I love that game. That's how I felt because uh, those are all great points. I thought that was so well put with the idea of uh, what's happening in, in the East and what's happening with Pfizer. I thought, wow, really good comparisons. Really interesting. It's just what everyone's dealing with right now. And, and I, don't, I, don't think anyone, I don't think anyone benefits from you know, pretending like, oh, you know, it's a, it's a bad thing, or it's, we can't talk about how organizations profit when, when other organizations need their help. That's just the nature of it, right? You don't need to, nothing needs to be exploitative in any way, but it is, it is the nature of, you know, when, when, and I hate this analogy, I hate myself for even bringing it up because it's so cheesy, but the stupid analogy of, I don't know, the, I think it's a, it's a, the chaos and, uh, some symbol for chaos and some language I forget is a combination of, of danger and opportunity, right? So there's, there's danger and chaos, but there's also opportunity and chaos and, and ransomware is spiking up a lot of, a lot of chaos. And in that you can, you can help, you can help. And that's a great opportunity, but there's also significant risk. And, and right now, right now people, people are losing, some people are losing the fight and it sucks. Um, and we got to, we got to do everything we can to help organizations get into a better spot. A lot of that, a lot of that starts with basic discipline around cybersecurity awareness and training for end users. And then, you know, just getting the basics, right. I was really excited to see, you know, in our last conversations we've had around cyber insurance and those policies, there's some basics now that the insurance providers are just mandating that you have in place. Multi-factor authentication is not a nice to have anymore. If you want cyber insurance, you have to have multi-factor authentication enabled, and you have to demonstrate to your insurance provider the policies you have in place to effectively manage that. It's not just a checkbox thing anymore. You have to have it. It's, it's, it's table stakes now, which is great. Great for the company long-term. I mean, it may, might feel like a real inconvenience in the moment to set that up, but down the road, when, when you need that protection, having it is, is really important. Yeah. And, and, and it's, it's not mandated, but it's, it's mandated by the, by the, by the market, mm -hmm. which is great, right? You have, you have insurance markets and a lot of the insurance providers got slapped pretty hard with, with insurance claims. So they're now adjusting their business models to say, okay, we'll provide you with coverage, but if you want coverage and you want to pay this premium, here's what we're going to require of you. Right. So it's that, it's that balance back and forth. No one's mandating anything. No one's mm -hmm. saying you must, or this is what you have to do, or it's not regulation where you're, you know, you're dealing with regulators who are two years behind advanced threats anyways, and still trying to catch up. It's, it's a market driven, market driven scenario, which, you know, is, you know, kind of the whole creative destruction idea is that's the best way to to advance those, those, those types of uh, requirements. And I think it's, I think it's really exciting that not exciting, exciting is the wrong word. I think that's, it's good that these things are being pulled to the forefront and, and more and more average people within an organization that historically knew nothing about cybersecurity, mm -hmm. that awareness is getting raised. Good insight, Adam. That's why people show up to this podcast for the insight.
So we talked a little tech. Adam, what else is happening? Anything going on in life? You know, no, nothing too crazy going on this week. It's uh, it for, for my family, it's the first week of summer. Uh, so having the kiddos around the house all day, every day is great and a true blessing. <laughs> yeah, no, that's all good. But no, just, uh, just, uh, you know, post, uh, post three day weekend, getting after it. Good to be back in the saddle. Love it. Nice. I recently found out I have a lot of scrub jays in my backyard that are scaring off other animals. So Adam, I found out that you can for $20 buy a CD of sounds that sound like scrub jays being attacked. So other scrub jays, the real scrub jay birds will avoid living in your backyard. So I might be purchasing a $20 CD to play sounds of scrub jays being attacked. So you're, you're running like a bird haunted house in your backyard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm running a bird haunted house, Adam. Uh, admissions free. The scrub jays will leave that are very aggressive, but all the other woodland creatures will still hang out. That's fantastic. We we had some quail get born in our little, we have a little in, internal area of our, our house where there's like a little, little sanctuary. Mm -hmm. And I had to transport 12 baby quail out to my backyard. Got that done. Uh, and then I have some, some young daughters who are like, oh, the baby quail, oh, the baby quail. Well, turns out infanticide is a bit of a thing in the bird in the animal kingdom. Oh boy, and, this, uh, this really took a turn from adorable to dark. Yeah. And well, so I had to kind of explain like, hey, you know, that might be a little rough. Well, some of the uh, other quails that were in the area kind of, uh, kind of, they, they, they weren't a fan of the offspring. So we'll just say that those. Those 12, I'm not quite sure they all made it. So. Well, Adam, I'm going to tell myself and all the listeners that all those quails made it. They made it to safety. That's how I'm going to think of it, Adam. And that's how I encourage all the listeners to think about it. We can cut that part out. Let's cut the quail part out. Nope. Adam, I don't have time to edit that. It's, we're keeping it in. Oh, man. All right. This is episode 17. If you're listening, thank you for joining me. And Adam, thank you for making this a great show with me. We'll see you next week for episode 18. Thanks so much. Have a good week, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. The Incident Report is brought to you by Quest Technology Management. With over 40 years of experience, Quest is a leading technology integrator working seamlessly with your staff and systems to achieve your IT goals. Learn more about everything they do at questsys.com. And if you have questions or suggestions for the podcast, you can always email Adam and myself at theincidentreport at questsys.com. We hope you have a great week and we'll see you next time.